thank you so much for coming uh, today. I'm a little nervous, so if I, when I'm nervous, I talk a little fast, and then my accent slowly becomes thicker. <laughs> so if you don't understand me, please raise your hands and I'll slow down. Uh, it's a good reminder for me. But thanks again so much for coming today. Uh, there are several reasons the, why the talk is called Parallel Lines, because I feel like as an artist and a graphic designer, you always have parallel practice and the way everything is working today and even though the technology is moving really fast, there are so many overlaps but still a lot of distinctions between art and design. And they sort of move together parallelly but overlaps and, then they, and that's how it has been even in my practice. So I wanted to address that. And also because I moved all the way from east side of the world to the west side of the world, and they run very, very parallelly for me as well. So there are just a lot of parallels that come in my work together. Uh, this is me when I was five years old. Um, I was born and brought up in India, and um, I had a very traditional and a mix of traditional and liberal upbringing, and I did my undergrad in India as well. And it was really like living in an organized chaos. There were very little pods of houses and everything around was chaotic. And if as an outsider you go there, you would wonder like, how does everything work? But somehow everything works. Um, so it was really like living in an organized chaos. Uh, this is one of the photographs on the street, and this is just everywhere. That's how you see little, little, these organized structures in the big chaos that you see. And I grew up, I grew up in that, and design, art, and craft was a huge part of everything. And because it was everything, it was nothing. Because it was everywhere, it became almost omnipresent. It wasn't there, and I didn't think about it and I didn't notice it. I just, that's just how it was and it never occurred to me that it could be anything else and that was what it was for me. And then I wanted to be an artist still because probably it had a huge subconscious effect on me seeing everything and when I told my father I want to be an artist, he was like, uh-uh, uh, you, how are you going to make money? Uh, that was the first thing he said, and so I became a graphic designer. It, we, we met our middle ground, so very parallel. Again, like we were walking together, and so I have a huge uh, background in advertising, and I loved it for three years. <laughs> really, really loved it for three years. I was 24, and I loved what I was learning. I loved the culture. I loved how much I could party. It was a new freedom for me. And um, a lot of things that I didn't aware of, but also it was really interesting to see that whatever I was surrounded with, advertising was a different world specifically also because it was the, the aesthetic in advertising at that time when I was doing it, it was early 2000s. It was very Western because India was still like very new at that time thinking about design. And I worked in a French um, advertising agency which had uh, called Publicis and they had a base in India at that time. And everything was very, the aesthetic was very Western driven. So that's what I started to learn, but after three years, I just felt like I was behind this corporate wall and I didn't have a voice, like I was speaking through the mind of a client and the job would come and it would be like, can you make this logo pretty in 20 minutes? And it was wonderful because I had never played with form like that before and because of the variety, like I just focused on form than on content. And there was a huge barrier also between you know, the way the advertising worked in India was, it was a copywriting team and there was a art director team and they would work together, but they would, a lot of the times, like the art director was considered to be somebody who would push or make the idea look pretty. And that was very hard for me to, so I went to my creative director and I fought with him. And then finally there was a rule that 
everything that would be done would be in a strategic continuum space. But the minute that change happened, I left advertising. So um, to, to come here, and um, that's why it, it became this space that I couldn't self-express, and I thought that that was a huge part of me. And because I was in India, there were a lot of things that became a part of me, as in, I, as I said before, I forgot to notice them. So there were a lot of subtext under what my tradition was. I took it as, as it was. I didn't question, as it, question it as much. I didn't self-express it. And I was very rebellious, and I didn't know why, because also I, there were a lot of things that didn't settle right inside. And it just, I couldn't make sense of it at that time. And it was only when I moved here and I saw the parallels, I was like, oh my God. It was really like that. And the first thing I came here was, I looked at the sky and I couldn't ever stop looking at it. It still amazes me because uh, my brother-in-law picked me up and he was like, oh, you must be in a great cultural shock. And I was like, the sky is huge. Like how? How did that happen? I didn't know that the sky was this huge, and that's all I could think about. For days, I would like just, just look at the sky. I couldn't believe how huge it was. So uh, you guys are really lucky. <laughs> and then when I got here, I went to school. I went to RIT first. I went to Rochester Institute of Technology. And then I went to uh, University of Florida. And University of Florida. Uh, it was a very interesting program because it was very graphic design driven, but at the same time, I had some amazing professors to work with, and it was a very self-driven program as well. So in the beginning, I was doing a lot of graphic design projects like packaging, shoes. I was exploring everything, but it was so amazing to see without even realizing it that my aesthetic has shifted from the Western to the Indian, and I was just exploring the, the Indian, in my, my being Indian, I had like finally come to terms with who I was. It, before that, I didn't even realize. I, f I would talk on the phone, and it felt like it was a secret code. Nobody could understand what I was talking about. And that's why I started thinking about how the culture, how culture or how time and how space affects the work. And I started talking to people. And I started looking at other people's work a lot and talking to them, and I realized how much time and space affects an artist's work. And that's how I'm really also approaching this talk about individual versus, like personal versus universal, but at the same time, like how much we take our surroundings and space for granted. And because there has been such a shift that I could see, like when I was making this talk, because I had no idea what I was talking about, <laughs> and, um, I looked at all my seven years of work and I realized like, it has changed so much and it has only been because of the time and the space that I was in. Otherwise, I don't know, like it would have probably changed in different ways, but right now this is how it has changed. So I was doing. I was really exploring my own culture and my own craft. I was never interested in craft before because it was everywhere. And I thought, why do people do crafts? Like, why do people do handicrafts? And India is surrounded by it. And it is what it feeds on. But it makes sense because everybody needed some kind of outlet to just do something, to meditate. I, I don't know. What, did you have some? Oh, OK, sorry. So I started thinking about the aesthetic in the beginning. And then slowly it was moving. And these were like, I was doing like patterns. And I didn't understand kind of what I was doing. It was for a wedding card. This was my wedding card, actually. Um, and then I started thinking about design. And I started thinking about why I came here. I came here to think about. I basically came here to get some space, first of all. Uh, it was really about the space that I felt like I just, I, I just needed some space in terms of what it is to be alone. And I knew that even if I was in India, it would be hard. And also, because I didn't understand how would I find a space or a profession or something where I have 
some kind of box or some kind of thing where I can express myself. So, it was, so when I started, first I started exploring the aesthetic and then I went a layer deeper and I started to think about what, what does design do for me? Like how can I use it beyond making packaging? How can I use it beyond making books? Uh, and all those things are beautiful and they suddenly made sense. After advertising for a really long time, I thought design is bad because it just was that culture for me that I thought that design was just bad. But it was over time that I realized that as human beings, we have innate desire to communicate. And that's why design is so important as well. Like it's so, it's a part of who we are. We always are craving for aesthetics. We're craving for, we have this desire to vanity and it's genetic. I don't know how it has evolved over years, but this is what the present world is. So I started thinking more about that in my, in my work and I started thinking about design activism in design school. And it's, this is one of my favorite quotes where it says, design activism uses artifacts and design processes to influence change by disrupting the status quo and revealing better visions for society. So it amazed me that even though I thought of design as a bad, like it has a lot of power, like advertising has a lot of power. So we did this campaign called I Local. I was studying in Gainesville, Florida, and the idea of local had never occurred to me before because in India, I would be like, hey, like there was big roads and there were like street hawkers and there were like people everywhere. So the idea of local never existed because the idea of corporate never existed. So the local was how it was. So it was when I came here, and I saw this, you know, like if you wanted chicken, you would just go to the shop and you would like move like this. And the person would like cut it and just hand you a fresh chicken. And I came here and I saw these like walls and walls and shelves and shelves of like food. And I was like, oh my God, what is this? I, I, where is this coming from? I didn't know. And at that time, local was a lot, local was a buzzword and everybody was talking about local, but so we wanted to think about actually what, what does local really mean? Like what is local? And the, the, the definition of local is, they say anything within 100 miles radius is local. So we went and talked to people about what they thought was local. And also because Gainesville was a town where it was a middle space for people. They were coming for their graduate school or their undergraduate school, and they thought of this space where they didn't think of it as a community, more as somewhere they were coming to study. It was never like, it was a rest stop for them. So it was never, and there were people from everywhere. There were 30,000 people, 30, 33,000 people in the university. And the idea of local all the more didn't exist there because they were all students, they were low on budget and local costs more expensive. So low, instead of like thinking of food, local became this idea of being in that space. That's really what local means. Like whenever you are, wherever you are, no matter wherever you're from, you are local. So we created this whole campaign where People like from everywhere, they said, I am from wherever, I'm from India and I bike local. So they started thinking about like, what do they do inside the city? It became more about what, what would they do inside that city? And then it became these series and series of like giant photo booths inside. And we started collaborating with a lot of businesses and we started talking about, you know, building a student community and a lot of yoga class, like it just, it just came together suddenly. And there were all these people and they created a whole database where people could submit what they do local. And it was not just about food. It was more about who they are in that space. And then again, it became more about the space. And that's when I realized like what was driving my practice. And it was eight of our grad students who did this project. It was a massive project and it's still continuing. Um, other people from the grad department are continuing it. And uh, one of the things that came from it was me thinking about, I can do something that I want to do, or I can do something what I want to think about. But it was still in this realm of graphic design, and I didn't, 
And I didn't even think about what are the differences or what is art and what is graphic design. It became more of what I wanted to do. But I wasn't, there was something, like I felt like there was a tactile nature to it that was missing because a lot of times graphic design has this thing where it's thought of it as like something polished and something like as a product. And even though even in art that is the case, uh, there's, I felt like there was this more tactile nature to it and it, I could be more chaotic and I could be not answerable to somebody and I could be in my own personal space. And I still thought that was missing in my graphic design practice. But then again, the, I did this another project like basing on, it's, it's like a continuum. So I'm presenting the work in a chronological order and thinking about how space has changed any artist's work if I look around. So we, had, we were eight grad students, and finally I had a, a, grad, a grad fellow who was Indian. And I was like, oh, okay, somebody understands what I'm saying in language, like almost, otherwise everybody understands what I'm saying, of course, but it was more about, oh, it's, it's different. But then I was sitting in the studio one day, and we had only one American in my grad program, and two, two Mexican, two Chinese, so we were, to Spanish, so it was basically an international grad program <laughs> and one, one American person. So I was sitting in my studio one day and five people were on phone and they were talking four different languages and I couldn't understand what they were saying. So we started doing this whole series where me and my fellow would talk in Hindi, in my language, and then we would present the video to my other studio mates and they would interpret it, and we created these, um, sorry, oh, it's gone. Sorry, I'm so sorry. So we created these posters where they, they were laser cut posters of these conversations that we've had. That's how it turned, the whole project turned out to be. Then secondly, after like thinking about my surroundings, I started thinking about back home when I was back to my own reality, okay? Like, it's time. Um, I started thinking about a lot of my experience being a woman in India because you're constantly reminded that you're a woman in India. Um, and I had not thought about that and there was a lot of subtext into what was talked to you or what was sent, said to you or the things that you were asked to do as a married woman or as just in general a woman. And of course, like there are subtext here too, but it was more traditional when I was back back home, and I had not, and I was surrounded. Like we had a lot of maids at home, we had a lot of help, extra help, and it was a completely different world. And it was a completely different world here, and the treatment of women was very very different too. Like women had already almost like accepted that this is their role in the society. Like it was. It was, and they were, and the interesting part was they were preaching other women to learn that as well. Like, yes, this is, this is your role. My, my mother had taught me, like, you should be a good wife. You should learn how to adjust. Like, it's just a part of growing up as a woman in India, too. But, and with that comes a lot of domestic violence. And I was surrounded by a lot of women who had a lot of domestic violence. So... That was something which was very, very important to me. And I started doing, again, thinking of my, my graphic design practice. I started thinking and created these series of posters where henna, um, henna is a symbol of marriage in India. And you do it, it's a symbol of color. And there are all these connotations attached to being married. Like when you get married, you wear red. And when, you, when your husband dies, you don't wear any color you only wear white. Uh, when you're a widow, you only wear white. You remove the vermilion, which is a symbol of an Indian married woman. So I started doing these henna series where I would, it was more like a subversive imagery. So instead of doing regular patterns, these patterns were of abuse. So, uh, you know, they're like knives and uh, what words written in Hindi, which were abusive. So it was this whole idea of like, 
take a closer look like just because somebody has applied henna and just because somebody is happy and they're wearing all these colors doesn't mean so it was more about because India has so like everybody gets involved like in India getting married is getting married to the family but it's also it was it's this commentary on because you're getting married in the family and because that's the culture can you also participate as a family in this factor you know in this in this space because when it comes to domestic violence it's always like oh it's between husband and wife you know it becomes this whole area where it's between husband and wife but if if they want a baby in the house then it's about a family issue if there is no dowry then it's a family issue but when there is abuse it's between husband and wife so it was more about the subversive nature of what's hidden inside so these patterns were all uh, driven into very like abusive kind of imagery. Yes. Uh, how permanent is this? It stays for at least 10, 15 days. But you apply henna on almost every Indian occasion. So it, it stays for 10, 15 days after you did it. Yeah. I've always wondered how. And then. They, they do it in Arab, uh, they do it in a lot of Middle Eastern spaces, and they do it in Indonesia. There are a lot of Asian, but in India specifically, because it's a huge part, it's like a whole ceremony in India where uh, the bride sits and gets this henna applied till here for like five, six hours, and it's a whole different, it's a, it's a completely different ceremony. It's a symbol of marriage, like you don't get married without henna. So, yeah. Um, then I started thinking again about the same issue and how the bed is such a metaphor for a married life. So I created this uh, bed sheet and it was, it's still incomplete. Um, but I wanted to show you in terms of like how I was thinking about the same issue. And slowly it was also changing in tools, in my approach to work, and it was changing in drawing. And um, this, this form right here, it's called Manu, Madhuvani paintings, which is a very traditional art from a particular uh, Indian state. Every state has its own traditional art in India. And in those states, there are separate villages which has their own separate traditional art. So this comes from this, and it's very famous because they sell a lot of handicrafts and you know, it's a very big symbol of marriage too because it started as when the woman gets married the whole room is painted in this style painting and it's like ceremonies or and it's uh, images of like women intimacy and you know moving traveling from their husbands fa from their family to their husband so i created again this like subversive sort of imagery where it's a bed sheet of like domestic violence so these all these imagery is where the man is hitting but it's also, again, subversive because from far you don't see it, but when you look closer, um, I was developing that aesthetic at that time. And then I started investigating into the cultural symbols. So I was very interested in the color red. Color red is a very, very big part of my practice, and I couldn't understand it, though, like why it is a big part of my practice. But I started thinking about why do we apply, why does only a woman has to apply the vermilion? There is no symbol of marriage for men in India. Um, it's only a symbol for women. Like if she wears vermilion, which goes in your mm, parting, or it's, it's the bindi, which is the red dot, there are as such no symbols. Like now people wear wedding rings, but there is no symbol of marriage for India, except there are a few villages in India where both men wear, get their ear pierced and they're like a particular kind of ear stud that you can tell that this man is married, but otherwise you don't know if the man is married or not in India. Um, so it was very interesting to me that there were a lot of cultural symbols, mostly for women. And it was only that I could realize that when I got here. So it was running very parallel in my mind at that time of how that culture has affected me or how does any culture affects you and how does moving or transition helps you or just gives you space to think in general. So I started thinking about what 
what is it? So I started writing. Writing became a huge part of my practice too, like just writing notes to myself and thinking about what are, because all of these, I used to find it so beautiful and I still find it very beautiful because aesthetically it's driven to a way, it's very sensuous, it's very colorful, it just attracts you. And there's something about the circle, like circle as a form just attracts you. You, you If there's a square and there's a circle, you'll always move further to the circle because of the form that it was and because of red. So I started thinking about all these cultural symbols and investigating them. And also started thinking about my personal practice and how can I use my personal thinking in my work. So I did this catalog of my memories. Uh, I started, again, I, you know, like I have a design background. So I started thinking, oh, how can I combine my drawings with text and how can I do all of these things? So I started doing this catalog. I started cataloging my memories and I wrote, and there were memories as such of that changed me. Something so simple like, you know, I was very young and uh, I was playing with my cousin and he fell and his father ran and he told her, stop crying like a girl. And it didn't register in my head what it meant then, you know? And so I started noticing the the trajectory of those memories of what are those defining moments where I thought what it is to be a woman in India. So I wanted to read one of those, which is, so this was a whole catalog. It was like 16 memories that I built, but I wanted to read you this one. So it said, standing in a crowded bus stop, bus, I was being smashed between men. I was being, I was I was being pushed by them and they were pulling me toward, I was pushing them away and they were pulling me towards them. I had never been so aware of my physical body whose presence was unbearing for me. I got out of the bus and felt the only thing I could have done was run away because it was so overwhelming and it felt very helpless in many ways too that it's the woman or it's me or it's somebody who is in that uncomfortable situation has to leave rather than the person who's doing the act. Um, so I started cataloging these memories and it started developing in my own practice. And I started think, um, if I, and I was thinking of the metaphor of what it is to be a woman, how does it move, what happens? And I was trying it in many different ways. I was trying it in video, I was trying it in drawing. I was just trying every tool. Like it was for the first time I was like, I can do anything. It was so bizarre to me. Um, so I want to show you this video, uh, which is one of my very, very early videos. That's why it's so shaky. It continues where she gets eaten up completely. Stop it. So I, I started thinking about what it was of what what was the metaphor, and it was it also hurt me a lot in many ways that I was thinking that way. I was thinking of my own, you know, my own relationship with being a woman and how it felt in that space, but. Slowly it evolved, it changed. Now when I go back, I see it's not the same. It's changing and it's really good to see that it's changing. But that I, I grew up in 1990s, which was this middle area. It, neither it was traditional, neither it was liberal. It was like somewhere in between and I was given both of them smashed together. Um, and then I started thinking about design practices and how I can use design practices in my own work. And um, my final thesis work was uh, 40 drawings and two videos. And um, I was given a lot of beef in my um, school because one thing that was questioned was how is this graphic design? Like there's always this like tiff of this is graphic design. It's very, very straight. It's very black and white of what is graphic design and what is um, not graphic design or what is art and what is graphic design, but it came from a more autoethnographic point of view. I was investigating my personal history into creating a narrative. So 
that's that's what I was doing, and this was the final show, um, and it was about me being in India again and changing the, how that changed the shift and how that it closed. My Mosa pudica is a plant uh, which basically you touch it and it curls, and when you leave it, um, and I used to be surrounded with it when I was in India, they were all over. So I, I used to play with them all the time. I would touch it and then it would leave and it would. So it almost felt like when I was there, I would, I would close myself and then I would open. So it became this metaphor and that's what the show was called at that time. And I had two videos in it. And I'll show you part of the video. And this video came from my conversation. Um, I was in a relationship with my then boyfriend, now husband, um, and I went to visit his mother. And his mother is very traditional, but very accepting. And in India, for me, I went to meet her mostly because before marriage, uh, before getting married to Debraj, my husband, I told him, I want to go see your parents in Malaysia. And he was like, why? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that will determine if I can marry you or not. <laughs> so um, I went to meet her, but it was a very interesting mix because she was very traditional, but she gave me a lot of space too. Like she told me her values, but she didn't impose them. And that was enough for me because I was hoping that it would be somebody who was just, in India, it's like just normal. Like when a woman comes in the house, they are told like how their house functions. And that's it. Like you're supposed to enter the house and you're supposed to learn how their house functions. But she was telling me how the house functions, what are the things she feels, but she never told me I have to do those. Like she told me, I can choose, I, and I, uh, with, with her I chose to fight my battles too. Um, but one thing that she told me which was very interesting was, and it told me like how, it made me think of how she feels. She said there are three births that a woman has. One is when she's born, one is when she gets married, and when once, when she has kids, there are only three ways, like a woman is born thrice. And that was her, you know, she's a, she's a wife, she's a mother, and she's a daughter. And, you know, so that's what the video is based in. It doesn't have sound. So uh, when you walk, when you go in India and when you get married, uh, there's a big red bowl of alta which is red and you put your feet in it and you walk and it's a symbol of that you've left the house behind and you're marking a new journey in your in this new and nothing goes back so this video was created thinking about the same ideas and keeps back and forth. It has a long video and I realize I'm really running out of time. So I'm gonna skip through some of my uh, slides because I would like some time for question answers. And then I moved to New York and in New York I did a lot of graphic design and interactive media. That was uh, really what I did basically. But then again, my design practice suddenly separated the minute I got out of grad school. Uh, because I had a graphic design practice and I packed my two bags and basically moved to New York, I needed to survive. So my graphic design practice came in very handy as a vocational skill, which I used to avoid. But suddenly it just came together. But then again, I, right after grad school, they again became very separate because this was graphic design and this was art. And I started, I, hired, I got a studio in New York and I started creating small scale work uh, and got really inspired by New York because the women were just beautiful in New York. And they were, they were just, the whole culture just reminded me of home. It was a different kind of like portrayal, but it was also cringing, but at the same time, like it feeds into vanity and a lot of other things that I'm interested in. So I started making small scale work when I was in New York. And these are like some of the altered books that I found um, in New York. Like you can find just $1 books on the streets. So I would like find these books and I would alter them and uh, look at the topics that I was interested in. And then I started thinking again about like 
jewelry and I started going back and these are some of the other drawings that I created at that time because it had a lot to do with the idea of intimacy and sexuality because until that time I had not thought about thought about it because it was in India you're not really talked about sex you know you're talked about it in a way where it's bad or you're only supposed to have it after marriage and uh, you know you never you never think of it because it's always the woman who in the terms like she's the one who suffers you know if sex gives you suffering it's 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 very it runs very overlapping so i started creating these like and jewelry like i would see beautiful jewelry in new york and even in india like i started thinking about sensuality and i started thinking about especially india because everything that women wear and everything it has this beautiful adornment quality to it and still like i lived in a culture where kama sutra came from but it was not talked about like it came from that space but now it is applied to all the other parts of the world except india so i just started thinking about because it is so driven in adornment sexuality physicality how a woman should look what man is and how also what desire is you know like when you are in new york you feel a lot of desire you you have this like even if you don't want to you end up feeling a lot of desire so i started thinking about those things and what it was when i was back there too like you know i wanted to think about all of those things but i felt very ashamed to think about those and i you know like picking up a kama sutra and reading it is considered like whoa what is this person reading because it's created it's thought of as a sex manual but it is really not a sex manual it is more of you know it it is a way of life like the way vatsyana who wrote it talks about it is about how there are three stages of life one is the meaning of life one is the worldly pleasure one is your responsibility so it's duty and responsibility one is world, worldly pleasures which is basically this and they say that your life is complete when they all come together and they move together in a continuum like you have to be good in all of those so he really talks about it from a point of view of sex as not just something that it's a way of life that's how he talks about it he talks about it from a level of pleasure he talks about it from every possible way so I started thinking about that and I started developing uh, I went to that year I went to India and I went to Khajuraho temples which is the sex temples in India and it fascinated me like the the quality of the work everything so i started working on that and suddenly again like the text came so the way he talks about it is he talks about how men and women are divided into three 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 categories uh, which is based on animal a woman is a deer a mare and an elephant and a man is a hare a horse and a bull and he talks about equals and unequal unions so a lot of work became very prevalent in text you know like i was reading the language and the language was also very visually metaphoric it was beautiful it is beautiful and i'm still working on these series so these are some of the drawings um from that series and i had a show in new orleans and i submitted those uh drawings so this is some of the work from there and then i moved to portland and i was miserable because i had moved from new york <laughs> and i was depressed like and i had i came back to i came back uh we moved to new york from new york immediately to portland and a month and a week later i went to india to have a research trip for 3 months and when i got back it was february and it was dreary and i was looking for a therapist because i was super depressed and i started thinking about suddenly like the distance came so much and i was feeling very bland i was feeling very bland in terms of like my surroundings and it's not that it was bland it was i was comparing it i was comparing it to something else and it had become plain simple you know and i was missing i was missing my people and suddenly the distance had become so clear to me like i had flew i'd fl- i've you know i flew from india here and it was crazy because it took me 42 hours and so i started thinking about the idea of memory and i started writing these postcards to everybody i love 
Um, and you know, I would create a memory in my head. Either it was a memory that was created or a memory that I was yearning for. And it was very plain, it was a simple image. And I would create the envelopes too, and it would map the distance. Uh, this has gone to New York, 33 Union Square. Um, it's gone to my friend, so I created these. I still send them, they're not as regular, and I was thinking about rituals and how my rituals affect my practice. So this, they were um, in a show in New York as well, so, so here. And then finally, uh, I created these series when everything started to make sense, why I was thinking the way I was thinking, is uh, because of my relationship with my mother. Uh, you know, I had a very um, open relationship, but at the same time, not an open relationship. She was somewhere in between. She was very liberal. She taught me to be very independent, but she also taught me what are my duties as a woman. And also, she, she loves, vanity is a very important part of her life. And my house is very, you know, my house is very traditional and very beautiful wood structures and very luscious sofas and you know all of these and I started thinking about the idea of a mother figure so I started creating these drawings um, these drawings are up in the library right now and they're coming down next week uh, so I started thinking about everything like the show became this culmination of everything how I related to my sexuality how I related to myself how I related myself with men, how I thought of myself in general. And it was like, I was a mirror image of her, but I was also defying her. So I started, uh, so I went to India and I worked with her and I finally shared with her and I started creating these drawings, uh, which are here right now. And uh, I wanted to share some of my uh, imagery with you, like, where, is, where does the inspiration come from? These are some of the images that I took on my last trip in India. This is a, this is a heap of vermilion that you put in your, uh, you know, in your uh, parting. And the same is here, you find fish, and that's how I dress up, like super, like I have to wear everything I can, possibly, uh, you know. And um, one of the pieces in, my show is this hook in which all these papers are hanging. And it's a very traditional, you know, it's not really traditional, it's just a normal way where people just keep piling up their bills or old papers and they never wanna look at it. And it became this symbol for me, it felt like a hook about all these questions that I wanted to ask my mother, but I never did. Uh, but also at the same time, it's something that is in the past and you know you will never look at it, but it's still there. So it's like omnipresent, but still present. So I created the same piece in the show as well, but I typed out almost like 200 questions to my mother that I wanted to ask her, and this is that piece. This is some of the installation shots from that show, actually. Um, and then this is another uh, installation piece from that show. Uh, my mom used to make me walk with uh, books on my head because uh, she used to think I walk like a boy. So she used to make me walk uh, with books on my head. So I created these shoes and it, it felt like I'm not present there, but I still am because every time I walk, you know, every time I do something, she's always present in many ways and I've learned how to, and that's why the show is also called Guilty About Not Being Guilty because I used to lie to her a lot, escape. And um, it came to a level where I was not even, I was guilty about not being guilty because I was doing all those things and I was being rebellious and I didn't care, but there came a point I was like, oh my God, I'm not even guilty about, you know, I'm not guilty about these things. And I started becoming more guilty about that I was not guilty. So it be became this cycle and that's what the show is called. Um, it's called Guilty About Not Being Guilty. Uh, these are some more uh, drawings from that show as well. Uh, then again, these are some of the imagery. That's my mom. Uh, I made her sit on that sofa and I collaged it. Uh, and you know, um, the, the top part, which is a candy, I used to eat that candy as a kid a lot and it's like these really like spicy black color balls and I, she used to tell me not to eat them all the time because you know, like it used to make my stomach upset, they were so spicy. 
And I would be like, no, 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 I didn't eat it. And she's like, open your mouth. It was really like Johnny, Johnny, yes, Papa. And it would be all black. Mm -hmm. So it was like, you know, I would hide it. And that's what uh, this drawing is, actually. This one right here. Uh, there's a video, but I'm not, I'm going to skip it. Uh, I just wanted to talk about some future directions. Uh, teaching has had a huge impact on my work as well, and I teach interactive media here. So I started thinking a lot about interactivity, and I always thought about it, but I didn't show up in my work as much. And I, uh, suddenly I came here, and they told me, oh, we'll do your visa. And I'm like, what? Like, how does that happen? Because I had to interview 29 lawyers to give me a visa. You know, it was like this whole process. But suddenly I felt like, oh, I'm settling here, but I still feel like an alien. And generally I had, I had to fill a lot of forms. You fill a lot of forms when you're an immigrant. So the space that you fill up, the, 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 the status quo that you have is you're an authorized alien allowed to work. So I'm an authorized alien, which is really how I also feel Neither I'm there, neither I'm here. It's like somewhere in between. So uh, I'm, crea I'm working. This is work in progress. I just wanted to share it with you. Um, so it's this series that I would do, uh, and you authorize, authorize me. So it's like I'm an alien. Authorized to know, I'm an alien. Authorized to clean, I'm an alien. Authorized to know. But this is just a work in progress. I'm investigating this series in multiple ways, but mostly interactive, because now all the forms are online as well. Um, and then another work that I'm working on is I'm working with uh, Indian women um, in India who work with traditional arts called Kantha. But I'm thinking of it more from a design point of view, but also from an artistic point of view. I want to do this collaborative work with them where I make my own drawings with them, but at the same time, I want to create a sustainable practice with them. So I want to collaborate with other designers who would go to these villages and these women can get fair trade money because they're really underprivileged. Uh, these are the situations they basically live in, but they do it, like this is who they are. So I'm going in June and July to work with them. Um, and I'm, Hoping this happens. <laughs> uh, thank you. Any questions?